So now I would like to launch us into our main event, which is called Transformative Technology for a Changing World. So each guest has, has provided a pre-recorded video. Um, our speakers are standing by for questions, so you can go ahead and ask them challenging questions after all three of them have presented. Or you can just use the chat feature and we will uh, read your question for you. So uh, I also will note that every year at our AGM we've, we've given door prizes. So this year will be no exception. We'll have two, we'll draw for two Saskatchewan made marketplace baskets, which are full of interesting snacks. So now let me welcome our speakers. Um, we have today speaking Dr. Stephen Webb, the Executive Director and CEO of the Global Institute for Food Security. Dr. Bart Lardner, Professor of Animal and Poultry Science in the College of Ag and Bioresources at the University of Saskatchewan. And Dr. Jason Donov, Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the University of Calgary. So our theme for our topics today is climate change and transformative technology. So climate change, it remains a hot topic, no pun intended, but it is constantly in the news and it isn't going away because the problem hasn't been resolved. And we are still talking about the merits of carbon taxes and the impact. And quite often agriculture is being pointed at as one of the causes of climate change. And we know agriculture can be far from perfect and it does have a huge impact on the environment. Crops cover millions of acres of land and greenhouse gas emissions come from cattle, fuel, fertilizers. As well, agriculture is highly dependent on petroleum, so we can't ignore the role of energy use in climate change. So the public has been hearing a lot of all, all the negative aspects and not many of the positives. So one of our roles at AgWest Bio is to encourage conversation and explore the ideas that the agriculture community is also got a lot of positives to share. So, and how are we expanding and how are we responding to the challenge? So Stephen Webb will discuss innovations in crop development. Bart Lardner will talk about what is happening in the livestock sector. And, and Jason Donov will explore the pros and cons of various energy sources in relation to agriculture. So if we could queue up Steve's video presentation, that's where we'll start our program. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Webb and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Global Institute for Food Security and it's my pleasure to be able to speak with you today at the AgWest Annual General Meeting. Agriculture is a technology intensive industry and technology development and technology adoption by agriculture has helped lift billions of people around the world out of poverty and into middle income. Technology revolutions such as the Green Revolution by Norman Borlaug with the adoption of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides has changed the uh, food outcomes for billions of people around the world. It's pushed people to food sustainability, it's helped raise incomes, and it's changed people's diets around the world from a, a more carbohydrate plant-based diet to a more protein meat-based diet. Those changes, those revolutions have had impacts here in North America on how we farm. We've changed our cropping systems to produce more protein based crops, to feed animals, to produce more meats. We at GIFS see three mega drivers that are impacting agriculture and we see technology as a solution and a wonderful opportunity to take Canadian agriculture to the next generation of, uh, of food systems. The three mega drivers that we see at GIFs are related to we will eat differently. We've seen shifts in the diet, as I mentioned, from a carbohydrate based diet. As people become uh, more wealthy, they move to a higher protein based diet. One of the other consequences of more income has been that people tend to eat more. And overconsumption has led to a significant increase of non-communicable metabolic diseases accounting for some of the largest loss of life in Western Europe and North America. And we're seeing that same trend emerge in Asian countries. Other changes related to the way we eat has, had started a few years ago with the adoption of uh, 
alternative meats like cultural meats, but also plant-based substitutes for meats. Again, these, these alternative-based meats complement animal production systems, and we've seen an increase in their use and adoption even through the COVID-19 crisis. We see changes in how we will produce food. And this is probably one of the areas that we're directly involved with is new technologies to change how food is produced, both how new plant varieties are made and produced by centers like the Crop Development Center here at the University of Saskatchewan through the Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center. We have computer scientists like Ian Stavnis, engineers like Scott Noble, plant breeders like Kirsten Bett and Curtis Posniak, all working together to develop uh, digitized tools and techniques to acquire images, analyze the images, and provide actionable information back to the breeders to support their breeding programs. The goal is to accelerate plant breeding in the face of climate changes. So again, thinking about how new tools and technologies can address the challenge of climate change. Other areas that we're interested in in climate change is thinking about how we develop sensor technology to monitor carbon, carbon and greenhouse gases. We all know here in the province of Saskatchewan that we have a carbon tax. One of the opportunities through technology is to be able to measure carbon sequestration and thinking about how can we create credits for producers and farmers. One of the challenges with farming is it's a very distributed and complex model. Enabling the measurement in real time on the farm from the plant, from the plot, to the field, to the system on how carbon is partitioned and sequestered can create a credit and an incentive for good agronomic practices. We're excited about that opportunity. The third area that we see driving change is disruption to trade, both domestic and international. On the domestic front, with the COVID-19 crisis, we saw disruption of our domestic supply chains, which resulted in a paradox of waste on the farm and an absence of food in the grocery stores, which created food insecurity for millions of Canadians. We need supply chains that are more resilient as opposed to just efficient. And again, technologies, digital technologies to model and map and build resiliency into supply chains is something that we need to develop in response to the challenges of COVID-19. Internationally, Canada has been the victim of non-tariff trade barriers, which has restricted our access to certain markets. We've needed to look for alternative markets and we've needed to think about new systems and controls that we can put in our export market supply chains to ensure uh, sample integrity, as well as biovigilance and biosecurity to ensure we're delivering the highest quality material to our customers in the, ex in the, in the international world. Again, tools and technologies that can be used to develop that kind of security system are being developed here at the in Saskatchewan companies like Veragrain on automated sampling procedures. Again, I'm excited about the opportunity that agricultural faces because in no time in my lifetime has food security and concerns about where their food comes from has been as high on the agenda of the Canadian public as it is today, in some ways due to COVID-19. It's a great opportunity for us in agriculture to develop partnerships and collaborations because no one organization can do it on their own. We need these partnerships with industry, government, and academic institutions to develop new tools, support the adoption, to create an agricultural ecosystem that is economically sustainable, aligned with environmental goals and objectives, and transparent for both our domestic consumers and our international markets. Technology and partnerships is a unique opportunity for us here in Saskatchewan. Organizations like Ag West can catalyze that, and I'm excited for the future of agriculture. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Okay, thank you, Steve. I uh, would just like to remind the audience that we will have a Q&A session at the end of all three speakers. So save your questions and 
use the chat feature to bring them to our attention. So our next speaker will be Bart Lardner, and we will just stand by to queue up Bart's video. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this invitation to speak at this webinar. My name is Bart Lardner, and I'm a professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science here at the University of Saskatchewan. And today I want to talk about beef cattle management and the environment. We look at the evolution of the beef cow today, we need to go back and look at its ancestors. The thousands and thousands of ruminants that roam the northern Great Plains and the evolution into what we see today as the modern beef cow. We can look at some numbers. In fact, going back to the 1800s, we see approximately 40 million bison roam the northern Great Plains, utilizing these vast grasslands. Today, we see in the US approximately 30 million beef cows, in Canada, 4 million beef cows, and here in Saskatchewan, 1.1 million beef cows. But beef cows serve a very important purpose, and that's to utilize those vast acres of forages and grasslands. In fact, the Western Canadian prairies are the ideal location for beef cattle production today. Looking at the amount of acres of pasture and rangelands in all of Canada, approximately 40 million acres of largely land that's not arable, uh, marginal land that we cannot grow cash crops, but we, certainly we can put a beef cow out there and turn it into a saleable product. Here in Saskatchewan, approximately 15 million acres of both tame seeded forages and native rangelands. And so we conduct a lot of research here at the Livestock Forage Center of Excellence, focusing on applied beef and forage research. A little anatomy, the beef cow has four stomach compartments. So the largest of these is the rumen, hence the term ruminants. But what's really amazing about the beef cow is the ability to upgrade plants of little nutritional value to humans into high quality protein. Thus, the beef cow is known as an upcycler taking these high cellulosic, low quality forages and converting them into high quality protein, micronutrients and other important products. How does it do this? It does it through a fermentation process, uh, through a relationship with rumen bugs made up largely of bacteria, viruses and protozoa. So once the feedstuffs enters the rumen, a fermentation process takes place. Uh, the byproducts or, or the end, end result of this is uh, volatile fatty acids, three volatile fatty acids, acetic, butyric, propionic, which are largely used as nutrient sources for the beef cow, and also an awful lot of gas is produced, which is eructated or burped off uh, by the animal over a daily basis and through this enteric probe of fermentation, and it's directly proportional to dry matter intake. One thing to note is that methane is about 25 times greater greenhouse gas effect compared to carbon dioxide. What's really interesting, however, is this methane that's eructated by the grazing beef cow consuming these structural and unstructural carbohydrates. After 10 years, we see a photochemical oxidation process converting the CH4 into CO2, which is cycled back down through photosynthesis taken up by the plants, and thus the whole cycle begins. When we look at the other carbon source entering the atmosphere, uh, burning of fossil fuels, which is old photosynthetic carbon, uh, this is presently not in the carbon cycle, and this then is accumulated in the atmosphere, thus we've exceeded the ability of the atmosphere to take up uh, CO2 from fossil fuel burning uh, by the plants in the oceans. And what's also interesting to note, since the lockdown in 2020, since January 2020, Worldwide greenhouse gas emissions have reduced by 17 million metric tons. So we've been we've been burning a lot less fossil fuels, but there's still the same number of cows. So something to consider. A little bit about carbon, the carbon cycle and sequestration. The beef cow is so important with this. We know that the plant is using photo. Uh, photosynthesis take up CO2 from the atmosphere. There's also respiration process taking place. We see carbon in the grass, carbon in the roots, liquid carbon in exudates. Uh, thus, the grazing cow is maintaining and it's, and it's sourcing its carbon from the plants that it eats. And so that's where all the carbon in the cows being eructed is from the forages and the plants that it's consuming. 
but it's this grazing, this disturbance that triggered by the grazing cow uh, to complete the cycle of moving the, uh, the carbon through the cow, erupted to CH4, converted to CO2, back through photorespiration and photosynthesis back into the plant. Another interesting thing is that beef cows do return a large portion of uh, excreted manure nutrients into the soil. And so we have systems out there that we can take advantage of the daily manure and urine excretion, thus the level of nitrogen and phosphorus deposited on different acres or different areas, uh, nutrient deficient areas of a farm or a ranch and thus taking advantage of this excretion process. We've seen some past research conducted looking at the change in the Canadian beef industry footprint between 1981 and 2011. And thus, they concluded that producing the same amount of beef in 2011, uh, that produced 15% less greenhouse gas is then compared to 1981. And thus these reductions largely through technologies that improve production efficiencies. And so integration of ionophores, uh, feed additives, these types of things. Okay. In my mind are probably the most sustainable individuals that I know of. Their objective is to leave resources, uh, better condition for the next generation, thus the plants, the soil, the atmosphere, the land, the water that they have control of. And also important to understand the Canadian beef produce, production accounts for only 0.04% of global greenhouse gas emissions and only 2.4% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Let's just turn our attention to some research. We know that legume plants through a symbiotic relationship are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. So thus, at least have more legume plants in these pasture systems and integrate beef cows with these pasture systems just to reduce these lower input costs. A couple of the forages that we've looked at in our research program are Sandpoint and Sicer Milk Fetch, two nitrogen fixing legumes. And so what are other ways we can, uh, strategies which we can use to mitigate GHG emissions in beef cows? We can feed high quality diets with integration of feed grains. We can graze these high quality immature pastures with the addition of these legume forages. How do we measure these emissions? A couple of techniques, a sulfur hexafluoride technique where we put a yoke around a cow's neck uh, and then over a 24 hour period, able to capture those nasal emissions and measure her CO2 and her CH4 emissions. Another one uh, less invasive is these greenhouse uh, green feed uh, trailers, we put them out and the animals are able to uh, go to the trailer for a treat and over a two minute period we can capture those nasal emissions as well in a grazing system in real time. Some of the work we've done just looked at integration of these legumes into pasture systems and we found that we put sisa milk vetch into a pasture system we saw reduced methane emissions and also greater uh, cattle gain on those paddocks. So just to wrap up, a lot of pasture in lands in, in Canada, rangelands, 40 million acres, beef producers are able to manage this and thus we're taking the beef cow, it's able to cycle these inedible forages into high quality protein, removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it into the ground through sequestration processes. These areas also provide tremendous wildlife habitat and thus enhance biodiversity and finally really do protect just marginal land from erosion. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to some questions. Okay, well, thank you, Bart. I have written down a few questions that I'll be asking after our last speaker. So now I'd like to have queue up Jason Donov, who will talk to us about alternative energy and its relation to agriculture. Hi, I'm Jason Donner from the University of Calgary. I'm going to be talking about agriculture, energy, and climate. The experts agree the climate is changing. It's real. It's our fossil fuel use that's doing almost all of it. It's us. It's also bad. Fires, extreme heat, floods, other natural disasters like hurricanes are going to be increasingly, increasingly a problem. And I want to be clear that Saskatchewan's agricultural industry can be a big help with this. As a physicist, I like to say that the universe is made of nothing but matter and energy. Matter, of course, comes from nature. If it was living fairly recently, then it was probably either grown on a farm or possibly from a forest. If it's non-living, it was probably mined. Saskatchewan, of course, does a fair amount of both the farming and the mining. 
For example, Saskatchewan is responsible for 25% of the world's uranium production in a single mine here in northern Saskatchewan. That's roughly one-tenth of the world's carbon-free electricity. Kind of amazing. This is the world's largest high-grade uranium ore supply, and for as extensive as Saskatchewan's contributions are to this, you could walk around this entire mine at the surface in under an hour. To be clear, this uranium has within it more energy than all of the natural gas and all of the oil that Canada winds up exporting if we put the uranium in one of the new Canadian small modular reactors that's currently being designed. Matter doesn't just come from nature, energy comes from nature as well. No matter which of these innovative renewable techni technologies we're talking about, all of them wind up being from nature. I also want to be clear that whether we're talking about tidal, most geothermal, wind, solar, hydropower, and even ocean current power, what it's really used for, with the exception of some forms of geothermal, is electricity. When we're looking at our fuels, what we can say is that we, broadly speaking, have two choices. We can have the type of fuels that pull carbon from the ground and release it into the atmosphere in a way that's changing the environment, our so-called fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, and coal, or we can have fuels that don't have a net release of carbon dioxide, which is to say nuclear fuels, like the uranium found in Saskatchewan, and of course, biofuels, like the canola, which is coincidentally also found in Saskatchewan. Unfortunately, nuclear, much like coal, is really just good for electricity. Now, in the future, it'll probably be good for some process heat, which could combine with agricultural things to, to agri agricultural residue to produce more things. But for the most part, what nuclear is really, really good at is electricity and could probably do a fair amount of the heating for industrial processes. But oil is used for something else as well. Actually, it's not just used for transportation fuels like your, your gasoline for your car and your kerosene for your, uh, your airplanes or your diesel for, for trucks and, and heavy equipment. Um, oil is not really used for electricity, which makes the uh, electric outlet there sad. In addition to its energy use, though, oil is also used for all sorts of petrochemical feedstocks from plastics to medicines to inks, oil products are everywhere. Well, in the future, instead of pulling that out of the ground and producing an awful lot of carbon dioxide in those petrochemical feedstocks, we could actually get a fair amount of that from agricultural products. Once again, Canadian research is currently going into how can we use biological outputs from the farming community, from the agricultural sector, to create a lot of the same products that we were having oil used for the last few decades. Farming technology has long been a really key driver in how the agricultural industry works. For example, in the 15th century, anywhere between half and three quarters of the world's population, depending on what country you were in, were operating inside of uh, the agricultural industry as a result of, well, let's be clear, fossil fuels. Oil and oil products have actually allowed us to power our farm equipment in a way that we can now say that in most countries in the world, it's fewer than 10% of the population is feeding everyone else. This technology hasn't stopped changing, and it will continue to be new, interesting, and innovative. Now, agriculture, in terms of greenhouse gases, is a net sink because it's actually pulling more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than the greenhouse gases that it's emitting. But agriculture can do even more in the future, and the rest of the world is going to need agriculture to step up because you can. People always ask me, what's the best source of energy? And the answer is, with time, the tendency is really pretty clear. We're getting a more and more diverse energy mix. So while we do need to reduce the amount of coal, the amount of uh, oil products, and the amount of natural gas, those are never going away. We're going to need it all, because as we go forward, energy will continue to be an important part of our way of life. Why do I like nuclear so much? 
Well, nuclear is my favorite form of generating electricity. It's a good way of doing it in a lot of situations, partially because it has such a small footprint. We're going to need all the room we can for the agriculture that we need moving forward. Now, some forms of renewable energy work better with agriculture than others. For example, if you want to produce one gigawatt of electricity, by way of comparison, Saskatchewan's entire electrical grid is four gigawatts. So for one quarter of Saskatchewan's electricity, here's the amount of space you would need for a hydro plant. Here's the amount of space you'd need for a solar plant. And here's the amount of space you would need for a wind farm for one gigawatt of electricity. To be clear, you can put wind farms on agricultural land, which all of you know, and you can sometimes put solar on agricultural land, which I'm sure all of you know, and I'm sure that you figured out that truthfully, hydro and say grazing cattle don't work real well together unless the hydropower plant is a river and maybe the cows can swim really well. But hydroelectric power plants actually take up a very large amount of space compared to nuclear. Now, this little tiny green box right here is the entire space that you need for nuclear, including the mine, the actual plant itself, and the deep geologic repository, which Canada is currently putting into place in order to deal with all of the spent fuel. It's interesting that in all of Canada, using nuclear power for the past several decades, only one deep geologic repository is currently being sought because only one is necessary. And quite strangely to everybody outside of the nuclear industry, people are fighting over who gets the right to bury nuclear waste in their backyard. I've often been asked, yeah, well, would you let nuclear waste be buried in your backyard? Yes, I would. I would raise my family next to a nuclear power plant. I would also raise my family on top of a nuclear waste repository. So going forward in our future, we need matter and energy now, and we will in the future too. So what's gonna happen in the future? Well, we can electrify just about everything. We can electrify our industrial, our commercial, and our residential energy use. But it's going to be quite difficult to electrify our transportation. Not impossible, it's certainly something that we're seeing, but Electricity isn't particularly well suited for that, nor is electricity well suited to be the matter feedstock for all the adhesives, carpeting, cosmetics, fertilizers, paints, rubber, fabrics, plastics. We're going to need some other source of carbon, something that maybe you can actually help with. All right, thank you, Jason. Thank all of you. So now we have about 15 minutes for you to um, open the floor, for us to open the floor for you to ask questions. Please just signal us on the chat if you would like to say something or raise your hand and we will and open your mic or I will um, read questions that are put up and I'm certainly happy to start the discussion. I think that this is, uh, I mean, we're a little bit preaching to the choir when it talk when we talk about the benefits of egg but there's a, a different conversation here when it comes to climate change. And I wouldn't hesitate for us to bring up some of the political challenges that egg faces um, when it comes to, to pointing the finger at agriculture, I guess is where I would say. So I'll start with a question first for Bart. Um, Bart, from, from Suzak, um, her question is, uh, how would the cattle industry using natural prairie more effectively market the fact to consumers that care or should care that grazing is important to conserve the endangered prairie ecosystem? So what is the value of an ecosystem that can never be reestablished once it's lost? And I think this is a long question. Does this immense value grazing cattle bring offset to the greenhouse gas emissions problems that they actually cause? Is it a net zero impact? Yeah, well, thanks very much uh, uh, for the invitation to be part of this webinar, first of all, and to, uh, to I guess, to, re to, to have a conversation about um, this very timely and, and actually uh, emotional topic today is, uh, as we've heard many times, finger pointing goes on. Uh, I guess what my video said was the importance of the beef cow, beef cow as, as an intermediate factor in the whole cycle, the whole recycling chain, 
of carbon and nitrogen. Um, I, I, I think we've seen initiatives of, of uh, branded programs out there already. Um, those also cause emotion within the beef industry. If we start to talk about forage finished beef versus grain finished beef, uh, we have those conversations, emotional conversations within the industry. Um, I think they're going to be even more vocal as we go forward. Uh, the importance of the prairie ecosystem is tremendous. In fact, I think there's only five, maybe 10% of the uh, native prairie left remnants of the short grass prairie, the tall grass prairie, fescue prairie. It's, it's why? Because it was plowed up because it was very uh, fertile areas for growing cash crops. I think we also need to um, you know, look at the value of, of, of what the beef cow brings. Uh, I, I believe that you know, at some point in the next 10 years or maybe sooner, uh, producers are going to look at adopting those those varieties of forages through the breeding programs at, at Crop Development Center uh, that are going to bring more value to their to their resources, their land resources. I think they're going to uh, obviously produce very nutritious forage. The animals are going to perform well that will reduce uh, the emissions by these grazing animals and, and, and capture more carbon. So. I see versus a tax, I'll see a premium uh, handed to those producers that are adopting these technologies. So, yeah, I, I think we just need, we've been very, we, we've, we've done a terrible job of, of uh, you know, talking about the, the, the positive aspects of, of grazing in cattle. I think we're ramping up big time now in the last five, six years, uh, organizations like Beef Cattle Research Council and Canadian Roundtable Sustainable Beef are those good voices. In fact, uh, just a, a, a tweet went out from CRSB in that the beef cattle production really helped preserve approximately 1.5 billion tons of carbon in Canada, a uh, value of about $83 billion. And so those are the messages that we need to get out to the general public and, and start to, you know, say these are the good things coming from the, from the cattle industry. Thanks, Bart. So I have to ask this, I, you know how this is our first video conference and you always take home some learnings. I wish that we had enabled a polling feature because I would really love to know how many in our audience would be willing to park their homes on a nuclear waste repository. <laughs> and I'm not so sure I'm there yet, but Jason, how far out is this technology? Uh, I mean, it, it seemed like such an obvious case that you've just made for us and you know what's holding us back is it not available yet which technology yes and uh, the small nuclear modules ah the small modular reactors yeah, yeah I thought, okay because because i i can talk about the deep geologic repository at length i can it's, it's it's one of those how long of an answer do you want kind of thing. Um, I can I can tell you, but you might want to kill me. Uh, <laughs> so small modular reactors are often touted as the next big new thing in Canada. Um, they're touted elsewhere. Uh, for example, just this morning, the Saskatchewan government announced that they're they're going to be looking very heavily at uh, the future of small modular reactors, as Saskatchewan's a really logical place to put those small modular reactors. Um, we've been doing, we the industry, have been doing small modular nuclear reactors since about the 1950s. So they're new and they're not new all at the same time. We have some innovative new small modular reactors and which ones will be available depends on a lot of things because there's, there's, you know, dozens of, one, of small modular reactors on the market. Some of them will be ready to to deploy in the next five to eight years. Some of them will be ready to deploy in 20 years. So it, it's, it's. I feel like I've really failed to answer your question. Uh, the reason we haven't done a lot of these commercially is that nuclear reactors really benefited from the economy of scale. So people wanted to build big initially to make it uh, cheaper to, to, to put nuclear reactors out there. Did, did that answer your question, Karen? Since you're temporarily the only man standing, Steve, <laughs> let me let me ask you a question. Um, you know, one thing we hear about since COVID is buy local. Um, so how can you know we obviously can't grow everything local? How can technology address diversifying our domestic food production to be self-sustaining 
And is there kind of a dichotomy between what we say we should do by local, but we want an avocado, which producing here is probably not going to be the best for climate change. Do you see that a, a little bit of disparity in what consumers want? I think that's been part of <clears throat> that's been part of the challenge when you look at agriculture, is what consumer what consumers food preferences are and then what they want in terms of uh, reduced environmental footprints on the production of certain foods. I do think, Karen, that technology that again has been around for a while, vertical farming, for example, some of the initiatives that um, that that we're exploring related to northern agriculture, I think can take advantage of improvements in technologies like different lighting technologies like LED, different construction techniques to be able to produce the right kinds of foods locally to be able to meet some of the needs. No, the avocado cannot and should not be grown here. And I am one of those consumers that does look for the avocado in the grocery store. But I do think more of the leafy greens, tomatoes, cucumbers, more of the vegetables, I think we can with the innovations in um, lower energy footprints for, uh, for uh, contained environment production. I think we need to take a look at those. Again, a lot of the technology that was developed originally by NASA for a manned flight to Mars, I think can be leveraged into ag. And I think, again, the impetus to move forward, I think COVID-19 has been more of a catalyst than it's pointed out a new new problem, but more it's a, a way to drive change. So I, I think it's a real opportunity for us here in Canada. Awesome. So we don't have too much time left, so I'd really like to get through some of the questions that have been asked. So I'll re-ask before I had technical difficulties. Uh, Jason. Um, did I hear you correctly when you said that the MacArthur River mine has the equivalent energy potential for all of Canada's annual oil and gas energy exports? It absolutely does if we can develop molten salt nuclear reactors, which there are two Canadian companies currently working on. Wow. Uh, the equivalent energy, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit tricky because Nuclear reactors are really good for electricity and process heat. Oil is really good for running things like uh, tractors and cars and so forth. So while there are certainly some companies that are looking at electrifying everything, uh, certainly Elon Musk's uh, companies are, are certainly trying very hard to do that. That's going to be tricky to do. So it's not just a, a swap and replace which is one of the things that agriculture can really do with, with biofuels and so forth. Um, so Saskatchewan just announced a new nuclear secretariat to push forward SMRs. Um, what do you feel the Western role is in this? We've got a pretty small grid in Saskatchewan. Should we be the leads? Absolutely. Uh, I moved to Alberta specifically because Alberta was looking at getting a nuclear power plant. Alberta is not getting a nuclear power plant before I retire. Uh, Saskatchewan, on the other hand, might. Um, so Saskatchewan has the right kind of grid. Uh, Saskatchewan's carbon intensity for its electricity is the worst of any of the, the provinces in the, in the entire Dominion. It's even worse than Alberta, which takes a fair amount to do. Um, certainly Saskatchewan's been at the forefront of, of carbon capture and sequestration with the Boundary Dam project. But small modular reactors would be a really, really effective way of uh, using Saskatchewan resources to uh, to collapse down that CO2 emissions from the electricity sector. Okay. So the next question is. Okay, some more connection issues yeah. there. Um, Jackie, I'll, or maybe someone Yeah, else. I'll read the question. Thanks for uh, how do you see the balance between the use of plant-based oils for food and feed versus the use of plant-based oils for biofuels and other industrial feedstock applications in the next 20 years? Um, and the question was meant for Jason. It's a, it's a tricky balance. Um, we have different generations of biofuels. First generation biofuels are a direct competition 
where the material is either used for food or it's used for fuel. While a lot of good work has been done with that, because of the growing population in the world, the growing efficiency of the agriculture industry is doing a good job of keeping up with that. But we use an awful lot more oil than we do use uh, fuel, uh, for, uh, food rather. So it's the second and third generation biofuels using agricultural residue and completely shifting things towards like uh, algae-based biofuel productions, which can be helped considerably with nuclear technologies going forward that I really see getting out of that food versus fuel fight. Okay. Hey, um, um, you know, everybody is welcome to use their microphones. You don't have to strictly use the chat feature. And so I'm going to ask for, is there any last, well, there is one last question here. So from Michael Robin, Steve, how do you see novel on-site production technologies rolling out such as Farm Boys and the Nassau Mars examples with regards to food security in rural and remote communities in Canada and elsewhere? I, I mean, I think, again, the Canada was at the is was do is doing the right things related to thinking about how do we provide food security, food nutrition and uh, food sustainability to northern regions. I think we if anything, the COVID-19 crisis of our ability to import foods from around the world due to domestic uh, disruption of the supply chains has incentivized that. And again, I think modular production close to the location. Jason's talked about uh, the carbon footprint of ag. A lot of it's related to the, the transportation of materials. So again, if we can produce uh, fresh fruits and vegetables closer to the, to the markets and in areas where they're needed that has the benefit of food security, food nutrition, and a reduced carbon footprint as well. So again, I think the technology is there and I, I think it's, uh, if anything, it's another reason for us to do it is because of the disruption in our supply chains that we've just experienced. It's the right thing to do. We, were th we are thinking about it and I think if anything, it's another call to action. So, Steve, do you have any thoughts on how we should embrace traceability from the farm as a result of COVID? Tyler, thanks for the question. Um, the answer is yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think the end of, before, before COVID, Tyler, I think the need for traceability is being demanded by, is being demanded more and more by consumers. Where is my food produced? How is my food produced? And that ability to integrate from, the plate back to the farm and again from a uh, managing complex supply networks i think traceability is doable today because of new innovations and in technologies and i think it's very important as well as related to the uh again COVID, just as an accelerant for why we need to change thanks for the question tyler So would anyone else like to, to try actually using their mic and asking any questions? Because I have one last question for Bart. So we know everybody, there's a lot of hype about, about plant proteins. Has, what is the climate, how do the climate footprints compare? Is that a fair comparison to plant-based protein versus animal protein? Uh, great question, uh, Karen. I don't know if I have the uh, background to address that. Uh, I guess I've always said that everybody has a choice uh, where you get your protein, whether it's plant-based or, or meat-based. And I, I don't agree with uh, one of those two individuals imposing their views on someone who doesn't want to hear it. So uh, fantastic. Yes. Um, if you like a plant source protein, then all the, all the more for you. Uh, you know, I mean, there's been some, there's been some uh, research, there's been some papers out there comparing the two. You know, you, it depends on, on uh, which jury you're listening to, whether it's uh, taking more energy to, to produce plant-based versus meat-based protein. Um, I am noticing, though, that 
just in, in general in the last year or so, we're seeing some of our major retail restaurant outlets are dropping that plant-based option. So I don't know whether that's because of COVID or uh, just today, I think McDonald's are, are taking the plant-based burger off their off their menu. So yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to, we need a healthy balance of, of both protein sources in our diet. And um, I think the conversation is going to continue. Well, if there are no more questions from the floor, um, anybody who knows me is knows I can go on for half an hour. And since we've had to listen to me for quite a bit, I will wrap it up and certainly thank our guest speakers. Um, each of you will receive a gift by mail, as well as we've made a donation on your behalf to Egg in the Classroom, which is um, well supported by Egg West, we believe in the cause. There's too many people too far from agriculture to understand the conversation. And if you don't understand the conversation, you're not asking the right questions. So I'd also, of course, like to thank our board members for their support and the Egg West Bio staff for putting this all together for us. And the, you, of course, the attendees, it's like I said, so awesome to see such a, a record attendance at a virtual AGM and five by five for their technical support. We couldn't have done it without you. So thank you again and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Karen. Bye. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.